conditions looked so favorable over the Gulf that at that point, we pretty much knew it was gonna go through a period of rapid strengthening. As a meteorologist, I think as, as anybody who follows weather, you have this thought in your head that you see it in the models and you just don't wanna believe it until it happens. Even 24 hours before, I mean, you have no idea. We were talking about a Category 4 hurricane in southwest Louisiana. You make a bad decision and that's it. There's going to be consequences for us and for the people here. We're talking high-end storms that are Cat 4 out in the Gulf of Mexico, making landfall as Cat 4s and Cat 3s. Because the storm continued intensifying, we became even more concerned as we approached nightfall that they were going to get stuck. here so I saw it all from Katrina and Rita and everything but uh, you know Katrina and Rita are separated by a month and all of a sudden we have this threat where you have uh, Marco coming out of the Northwest Caribbean coming into the Gulf expected to strengthen uh, possibly into a hurricane and then you have Laura which is just chugging along not doing much at first it was fighting with the big islands of the Caribbean and then all of a sudden the models pick up on it. So based on all of this, we decided to meet up with Greg and Brent, and it looked like we were gonna to have to deal with two hurricane missions basically at the same time. Now at first, it looked like Marco was Texas bound, but as time went on, that kind of shifted more towards maybe Louisiana, Mississippi, and you know, we still had Laura, which was way out in the Atlantic still, maybe even could be a threat to South Florida. With time, the models trended back towards Louisiana, and so, you know, we're, we were focused sort of on Laura because the model said, hey, you know, Laura could be a big hurricane in the Gulf, but first we had to get through this Marco threat and it was unprecedented. Both tracks coming into the Gulf at the same time. We had to mobilize all of our gear. We were gonna bring everything we had with us for this mission. And of course we had to make sure that all four of us were ready, but life is busy. I mean, my kids were getting ready to start school back again. Brent had to get up from the Virgin Islands, getting out of there up into Miami. Good afternoon, everyone. Brent here with Tim. It is Friday, August 21st, about 1230. Um, Tim is taking me to the airport. I think it was still a possibility I was two, so I wasn't sure which one was going to come. Or, man, thoughts in the back of my head where they're going to hit each other and nothing. I was going to get nothing. And then, of course, we had Greg and his situation. He and his wife, believe it or not, we're going to be closing on a house on the 24th and looming in the background was the possibility of not just one, but two hurricanes that could come along and interfere with those plans. My biggest fear was this was a big life event. So it's not like I could just be like, oh, I'll come back in a week and take care of it. So I knew I had to get this done no matter what, but I was concerned because I really felt like as Mark and others did too, the Lord was gonna be a big ticket item. Hey, good afternoon to you all. It's about 310 here on Friday afternoon, I-95. In South Carolina, there's Mike Farrow. Yep, on the road again. Uh, this time we're going to Lake City, Florida for the night. Lake City is, Mark's told me a lot about Lake City. It's kind of like a, a jumping off spot for him here in the state of Florida. Once again, we were at our old rendezvous point there in Lake City where I-10 and I-75 come together. 
Uh, Brent was gonna come up from Miami. He was making that long drive from Miami to Lake City, and his plan was to meet us the next day. There he is. Woo. That's a haul from St. John. <laughs> That's pretty amazing to drive that from St. John. Yeah. <laughs> they got that bridge finished. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, I got to admit, uh, sense of humor is, is pretty good at a, at a time like this. It's good that they can maintain their sense of humor. I mean, they're dealing with some pretty serious stuff here, so it's uh, a little levity is, is healthy. Around five o'clock, start hear all this rustling around. Go outside. I go out, look, look out there. It's like the Tour de France crew is loading up, going out for a ride, man. There's like 30 people in the hallway <laughs> with bikes, and everybody needs a scoop of ice. Yeah, the Tour de France crew, I remember that. So it interrupts your sleep. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't get into like 1 o'clock that night, probably, or and something. I was late. And already tired. Already tired, yeah. There's a lot going on, no doubt about it, but we were focused on the mission ahead and it was very good to kind of have all four of us set and ready to go because I mean, think about it. This is very serious stuff. Lives are gonna change forever over the next few days here and we're gonna document how those changes occur. And despite 2020 doing everything that it can to be 2020, you know, we're a special breed and we're gonna forge through and get this done no matter what. It's one of the most bizarre situations know, I've ever is, seen. I mean, you've been doing it even longer than me. This is probably one of the most weird, challenging, difficult right. forecasts. And it just goes with the year, 2020. Yeah, no bare minimum. But I'm already confused. It was really fascinating watching and listening to all this and all that they were talking about in the various scenarios. But I'm just basically the rookie here and that's fine. Uh, I'm willing to help out wherever I can. Just feed me, give me a nice place to sleep, and I'll be ready to go the next day, strapping boxes to poles or whatever the case may be. Uh, I went to sleep thinking this wouldn't do anything, and I woke up like, oh my goodness. But you can see with these tiny storms how fragile they are, and as quickly as they spin up, they can go the other way just as quickly. Yeah, Marco was tricky, no doubt about it. But despite that and the uncertainty in the forecast, was it even gonna survive? You know, we figured, yeah, we'll go ahead and set up all this equipment starting the next morning in Gulfport, in Mississippi, and then eventually make our way down to Grand Isle. Ready for, oh, great news. Uh, lawyer hit up my wife. We're closing tomorrow no matter what. All right. They're staying open. Uh, well, good. That'll be out of the yeah, way. Get that done and go after war. All right. War is going to be the real deal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Marco maintained its intensity overnight, but the National Hurricane Center was indicating that it should weaken before landfall. However, I think the biggest change that we noticed was the track forecast. That was now focused more on southeast Louisiana, the Mississippi coast area. So this was it. It was time to set out the gear and get ready. Can you grab two zip ties, Mike? Come here. So this doesn't start flapping around. I knew with Marco there was a lot of wind shear, there was a lot of dry air, and I knew it would be difficult for Marco to really be much more than a tropical storm. You know, Marco was not expected to really rapidly strengthen, but that morning in the Northwest Caribbean, you know how the Northwest Caribbean is, and it started just kind of bombing out at that point, and it became a hurricane in the Northwest Caribbean before it into the Gulf of Mexico, and it's like, uh-oh, uh, we have a problem. We set up cameras in Gulfport, and then we made our way over to Waveland, right along the beach road there where we set up cameras. Interestingly enough, right in the same spot where Greg and I had set them up back in June for Tropical Storm Cristobal. And once we were done with that, we made our way up to Mandeville along the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain, also utilizing the same spot that we did back in June. So this is where I was for uh, Cristobal. Greg here helped me with that one. You remember Cristobal back in June? Yeah, that was a pretty good storm. And it actually overachieved here. Kind of caught people by surprise. Right. People were not expecting storm surge and we got at least a few feet here. Yeah, it took like 36 yeah. hours for it to go away. It was getting late in the day and we still needed to make our way down to Grand Isle. Uh, this is a location that, believe it or not, in all my years of intercepting hurricanes, I've never been to this spot. So I was definitely eager to get there. Frankly, I was a little surprised when Mark told me that he'd never been to Grand Isle before. It's, 
many hurricanes as he's gone, gone to down that way, but to Grand Isle, no. So we were kind of experiencing uh, it uh, together. This particular camera system was gonna run about 80 hours or so. It had double batteries in there, so it gives us the maximum amount of time possible. And of course, this would let us capture whatever effects come in from Marco, and then presumably whatever happens when Laura passed by to the south a couple of days later. A great example of how the technology that we are using allows us to utilize these camera systems in these remote places like Grand Isle and I know it's a long way and a lot of effort to get down there, but as I say often, it is always worth that effort because you just never know when we're setting something up in a place like Grand Isle that could capture something truly historic. All right, so it's August 24th now, Monday, almost 5 p.m. Eastern, Gulfport, Mississippi here, picking up our cameras from uh, the now defunct Marco. As it turned out, Marco really couldn't hold it together and made landfall as a weak and disorganized tropical storm. Now, we had put a pretty good amount of effort into setting equipment up for this, but you know, it was fine. We still had plenty of time to go get that equipment and get it ready for Laura. So that was it for Marco, pretty much a non-event. Now, Mark obviously knows that these things happen with storms. They turn out to be non-events, but he also knew what was coming, and that was Lara. Now we could all focus on Lara, which was poised at this point to become, it looked like a major hurricane, a very intense hurricane in the Northwest Gulf of Mexico. So the question then became, where was it gonna make landfall uh, we weren't sure, you know, that was still yet to be determined, but at least for now, we were headed for Lafayette for the night. So, flat tire, huh? That's bad timing. Yeah. I guess it's better than 10 minutes before the eye wall. It'd be nicer than 8 in the morning after going to bed at 2. You stayed up too late. Couldn't, couldn't fall asleep. I know, it's hard. And you got the action on your mind. What do they say in the pit box? What did they say in the pit box? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they say, hurry! Hey! Mark had called AAA, but like AAA can do, they were taking a little bit too long, so we had to get going. We just put the spare tire on to, so we could get rolling again. So the tire's changed, the crisis averted, on. hopefully. But we gotta get the, we gotta get that guy plugged. That's no good. Let's see if we can find the, yeah. what the problem was. Pebble. Yeah, I'm gonna run over to Ross Tire and Service. Plug up the tire, hopefully. That's it, I'm done. Ready we don't know what the heck happened to it. No. Yeah. Mysterious. Yeah, hopefully they find something they can plug. Man. Otherwise, maybe they can Otherwise, we have to buy a new tire. After getting the mystery flat tire situation solved, that was kind of weird. I'm not real sure how it happened, but whatever. Uh, Greg and I went over to pick up some more supplies, water and some snacks and just general food items to get us through the next two or three days. The sun kissed pears and water cups. We had a lot of those. Tuna fish. We got a lot of tuna fish and crackers, chips. I don't know, I think that's all I had that trip. I ate all those fruit cups too. Right. 12 pack of Red Bull, I drank all those. 
Well, Greg, we always say we're just going from one bizarre situation to the next. I yeah. think this has trouble written all over it. And Houston's on edge, man. And as they should. If this comes to the peak intensity we think it will, I mean, this is going to be one of the worst hurricanes in Houston history. So you have to understand, the GFS and the Euro were at odds with each other, as is always the case, it seems. The GFS was more towards Lake Charles and vicinity, while the Euro, or the ECMWF and its ensemble members, including the ensemble mean, or the average, was suggesting Southeast Texas, with Houston in the core of what would have been an extremely intense hurricane. It wow. could easily, it could easily. I mean, imagine a strong four going into just west of Houston. I mean, my goodness. If this is ramping up and going to impact a Houston, how many people are gonna die on the road? Uh, you just looked at Rita and they had 100 people die just because of the traffic and evacuation, uh, special needs patients. Uh, and you know, there, we don't have the wherewithal to evacuate five million people on 48 hours notice. And this is, this is the thing that really, really makes me nervous moving forward. You look at Harvey, you look at Michael, you look at Laura and subsequent hurricanes. They all were tropical depressions two days before they made landfall. But it was around a really critical time in which evacuation decision making was occurring uh, in the Houston area, Harris County. And I, I know there was an awful lot of um, uh, coordination between uh, the local forecast office in Houston, NHC, and the local officials about that. Whatever was gonna happen with Laura was gonna happen within the next 48 hours. That much we knew for sure. So at this point, it was time for us to begin setting up the most advanced equipment that we've ever had across a very challenging stretch of coastline. Cameron, Louisiana, 1.20 p.m. and it's August the 25th, right? Yep, August 25th. Yeah, so Cameron's got some history. Oh, yeah. Rita, Audrey. If you're going to cover a hurricane in Louisiana, you have to have a game plan. You can't go down to the coast. We have so much more debris flying, trees going down, branches going down. It's not like you, have, you go down to the beach and you can report from there because, one, the beach is going to be inundated with 10, 15, 20 feet of water. So it's a, it's a whole different animal to cover. We know the history down here. We know that it's a no man's land really in any hurricane, much less one as powerful and as intense as Laura was. And in fact, the National Hurricane Center's messaging was very clear. In their words, it was unsurvivable, the storm surge, unsurvivable if caught out in that peak surge. And, you know, we had to take that into consideration. But there's also the wind from this intensifying hurricane, terrifying even for us. RM Young anemometer, as good as they come. We got the pressure sensor here. You can see what we're working with. Got in a Pelican case. Man, this was very exciting. This, this was the real deal. This was real science, real data we were gonna start collecting. Everybody was excited. Mark was literally jumping up and down. And I got into it too, because I could feel the excitement, the, the adrenaline was pumping, and this was gonna be real science that we were going to accomplish here. I think that this quest for wind data goes back to my childhood and the early days of my career. Now, at this point, I felt like we finally had a viable solution to sample extreme winds from the core of a violent hurricane such as Laura. But the key is you must place that equipment in the exact spot. And we don't know where that's gonna be. You know, we're guessing here 24 to 36 hours out so that the core, the eye will go right over that location, giving us those high winds. If it wobbles, just a few miles either direction, you miss the whole thing. Twenty-four hours to go, a little bit more than that, maybe thirty till landfall of Hurricane Laura. Just checked into the Hampton Inn. 
gonna be getting ready to work on some stuff, get equipment ready, a video update, and then tomorrow it's showtime. Too, the forecasts were starting to hone in on southwestern Louisiana. There were still a few wobbles between the northeastern Texas and southwest Louisiana, but uh, it was around that time that we really thought you know, this was going to become, a, unfortunately, a, a big, powerful hurricane. My heart really began to sink because um, Laura was intensifying as it was getting closer to the coast. Just kind of like Harvey did and like what Michael did, it's ramping up and there is no sign that this is going to even slow down in its uh, momentum on getting more intense prior to landfall. So that's when you're going, oh, tomorrow's gonna be a very different day for a lot of people. At that point, when you have a category four type storm, borderline uh, almost a category five it, one small mistake one error you know whether you position yourselves out in the open or you know something happens that could be catastrophic in terms of what could happen to you know the team Well, we started the day over in Winnie, Texas, after setting up a couple of camera systems in Port Arthur the night before. After that, we made our way back over to Holly Beach because our live camera system there had, for some reason, stopped streaming, so we were trying to remedy that situation. Never could figure out what the issue was. It was in and out, and it finally just went out. We said we have to just move on and hope that the GoPro captures everything. So from there, we go over to Shoepick Bayou, which is near Carlos. Uh, north of Hackberry and this is where I wanted to set up the second weather station. I thought this is a really good location Let's put the weather station here, and then we'll put a another camera system close by The surge is probably gonna come up and get the box, but until that happens We will get some good wind data at least so there's that I think that despite the geographic challenges and the time challenges, you know this category 4 hurricane closing in on Louisiana, we were doing a pretty good job. We had a camera set up in Grand Isle. We had one over in Cameron, uh, Holly Beach, and then Johnson's Bayou. We had the weather station, of course, over the Sabine River. A couple camera systems set up in Port Arthur. Now we were making our way over to the Hackberry and Shoepick Bayou area before finally heading up north to Lake Charles to figure out what we were gonna do from there. Dire times in Louisiana as major Hurricane Laura approaches. All right, so right now, 1.45 Central Time, the first band, Hurricane Laura coming in. Mike's gonna drive us to Lake Charles to meet with Charles Peak from the Weather Channel. We found a casino resort along the Calcasieu River. And we were looking for a safe place in the back of the uh, resort area, and there just wasn't a good place for the cameraman to set up. All right, headed over here to set up a camera that'll assist the Weather Channel's legendary Jim Cantori. Jim was trying to figure out what we could do there, and I knew that Mark Suddeth was in the area, and I said, we could maybe have Mark set up a remote camera, and he thought that was a great idea. So I contacted Mark and he came over and set up a camera that ended up giving us great footage back there during the storm. The atmosphere is juiced. This is gonna be a different world tomorrow. Yep. Are you ready? Well, it's gonna be tonight. Right. That's gonna be an, that's gonna be the challenge. You've been enough through these enough though. You're you mentally generally know what's coming, but every one of them is different, isn't it? Absolutely. You just I mean and the big one on this is the surge. And I, as you know, the track just, I mean, a matter of miles can make all the difference in yeah. the world. And there's no way to accurately predict right. it. It is dangerous to be along the coast there because of the swampy flat lands and the surge can push up tens of miles. And the idea is we're gonna put the live cam over here on this tree right here. 
I forgot this comes off. Got to remember these things. Uh, we're going to put the camera on the, that tree right there. A lot of discussion about where to put the camera. And Jim Cantore told us that he would put it on the tree. We wanted to put it on the pole over there, but Jim Cantore said the tree. So we put it on the tree. All right, 3.40 p.m. here in Lake Charles. We're just leaving the hotel. Got the camera set up there where Jim Cantore is going to be reporting live for the event. Okay, we're up to about seven or eight hours now until the landfall of this beast of a hurricane. And it's obvious that two things are going to occur. The first, it's going to make landfall as at least a Category 4 maybe even a Category 5. That was not out of the realm of possibility. And then the second thing, which was really just awful, this was all going to happen at night. The camera set up at the back of the hotel. We'll see what happens. I'm really hoping that the generators in the hotel uh, will provide just enough light that we can see what's going on tonight because unfortunately, Laura is going to be coming in after dark. That's a big thumbs down. I was asked by CBS News to provide an opportunity for them to interview me, so Mike and I took care of that over at the Golden Nugget behind the hotel casino there near the water and got that done. That was going to be airing on CBS this morning the next day. So all of that was out of the way. We were able to focus now on Laura 100%, and this is very important because, I mean, this is a strengthening hurricane coming in. We have to figure out where is everybody going to be once this beast of a hurricane comes in tonight? This is going to happen at 2, 3 in the morning. That's a whole different level of terrifying that, quite honestly, I hope to never experience. Okay, we have a hurricane coming in and people are going to be experiencing tornado-like winds, not for five minutes, but for an hour, for 90 minutes, where you're going to have these gusts, 110, 115, 130. That was by far the most stressful part. Because look, I want to be in this. I want to get as close as I can within reason, but I'm not stupid. If we were not going to find a strong building, we would have headed north. We would have gone more inland. But I told uh, Brent, I was like, look, there's plenty of parking garages. Let's see if we can get into some. If we can find a nice, safe parking garage, I have no problem riding it out. Because we went to the casino for, we went, well, we went to the hospital, and then we went to the casino, and you needed a room. We tried to bribe the guy at the thing, say, hey, can we just pay you for a parking spot? You know, like, just let us in. They said, no, you gotta get a room. We went in there, there was about 500 people in line to get a room. I had been to the Golden Nugget with Mike when I provided that interview to CBS News, and we noticed all of these big SUVs there, really nice premium SUVs that the media uses for their coverage of Hurricane Laura. Uh, and it turned out though that you have to have a room there. Apparently you can't just park there. You must have a room if you want to park under there where all those SUVs were or use the parking garage. So our guys, uh, Brent and Greg, they kept looking and finally they got lucky. And that's when we went downtown Lake Charles. And then we got, yeah, we pulled up to that one. I was like, oh, I'll just go talk to the guy. I'm gonna I'm give him some money. He was like, come on in. Nobody, else. like, he just opened the gate. We told him, hey, we're looking for a spot. Come on in. Right next to the Capital One building. Yeah, right next to the Capital One. So this plan of ours was spectacular. We had all of this equipment placed remotely down at the extremely vulnerable coastline. Now, despite the fact that we knew Laura was going to make landfall after dark, I still had pretty good confidence that our cameras would see enough to have made that effort worthwhile. But it was the fact that every camera box that we had was accompanied with a pressure sensor that was actually more important to me than the video data in this situation. Because no matter what happens, you know, again, this is coming in at night, we're not going to see very much. We're going to go away from this event with an incredible amount of meteorological data. 